make your way on over. I'll also ask for the panelists to come up to the front. Why don't you come up here as well, too, since you're our co organizer of all this? Uh, so, everyone ready? Yep. Yes. One more time. Everyone ready? Yeah! All right, here we go. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sydney Swain Simon, and this doesn't work. And uh, I'm the AI fellow here at District 3. Uh, so, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, very, very excited to have so many people participating. Uh, before we get into the content of uh, the main uh, part of tonight, I want to just quickly put our hands together for Eva Do. Without their support, none of this would have been possible. They're a big sponsor, they're big, uh, not just for this event, but to Montreal overall. So thank you. Uh, thank them. For, thank you for all the thank them. So um, before we allow for our panelists to present themselves, uh, I just want to do a quick presentation about District 3, and then Dave will be presenting a little bit about Creative Destruction Labs. Uh, who here is at their first time at the District 3? Okay, who here is at their first time hearing about District 3? Okay, so not too bad. Uh, so uh, I'll very quickly go through this. Uh, so our mission essentially at District 3 is to help innovative minds achieve their true impact. Uh, the way that we do this is we help entrepreneurs, innovators overall, uh, grow through this process of being able to ideate on what exactly they want to be able to do, help to discover the customers that are going to help them achieve their impact. We help with prototyping services as well, and we help you to acquire your first uh, initial customer. So this is a service that we offer to the Montreal as a whole. It's not Concordia centric. And uh, you know, we have had people from across Montreal, even across Canada, have come to us for uh, services. So we, since about 2014, have hosted about uh, 450 startups. Uh, we've been able to host around 230 events, and we've been able to have contact points with about 8,000 people or so. Uh, the way that we function is that we have our main services, but we also have our verticals where we also do initiatives around that. Uh, so I'm focused around artificial intelligence, and uh, the Zad in the back there, she's focused around life. Um, we're also, as part of the, um, the artificial intelligence vertical, some of the things that we've done in terms of support is that we've helped provide support for the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. This is a new initiative created by Abhishek Gupta. Uh, he's a, an employee of District 3, and his main interest is how can we think about tangible and practical research in the world of ethics of AI. Uh, in my role as the uh, AI fellow, uh, I was the local ambassador for the AI X Prize. So if you're not familiar with the competition, it's a multi-million dollar international competition which asks for teams to solve grand challenges. Uh, grand challenges could be things like solving health problems, environmental problems, anything of that nature. Uh, we have uh, three teams that, there's many teams that we support. There's currently seven that are uh, in the competition right now. We have Ubenwa, which uh, they're not here today, but they're a fantastic team. Uh, a Fred, which you're gonna be hearing a little bit more about as well. And we also have uh, Mr. Young, who is over there, and they're doing some really fantastic work as well. Um, we also wanted to tell you a little bit about the new program that we're going to be launching uh, in September. So uh, it's called the AI and Life Science Discovery Program. It's a merging of the AI district and the life science one. Uh, essentially what we're interested in doing is finding ways where we can apply AI in the life sciences domain. So life science could be things like agriculture, it could be things around health, it could be things around zoology. And uh, the reason we're doing this is just because of the fact that there's so much more information that's becoming available. Um, so to kind of give you an idea uh, or an example, uh, in health, you know, we have a doubling of information every three to four years. And because of this, it's just creating so many more new opportunities. So this is a program that we're essentially helping, uh, that we're providing for free. Uh, and it's something that we haven't really seen being done anywhere across the world, where we'll give uh, AI scientists, uh, AI developers, software developers, and uh, life scientists a little bit of that taste of entrepreneurship. So it's a six week program where essentially we bring you together, uh, we give you the basic training of how to really build something impactful that will have a big, uh, you know, we'll be able to, you'll be able to go out there and use as a method to really expand on your impact. And uh, so it'll be something that we're gonna be doing, it's every Wednesdays uh, at night. Uh, so it's a very minimal in terms of commitment, that's really just to give you that first taste of entrepreneurship. So by the end of it, you're gonna have a prototype 
a pitch deck that you're going to be able to also present, and your first iteration of your business model. So it's a really, like I said, it's a really good fit for people that are for coming from the life science research domain, as well as software engineers and uh, AI developers. So uh, go to d3sensor.ca to find out a little bit more about that. But with that, I wanted to pass it on to Wendy, who is going to tell you a little bit more about Creative Destruction Labs. Can I do it with me? Sure. You want to do it with that? And I'm here with my colleague, Pam Alfred, and um, she's a venture manager like me as well. So I'm here to tell you about CD and what we do, how we help start a flow. So to give you a bit of a background about the program, CDM was started by a professor, his name is Ajay Agarwal. He started this around six years back at the University of Toronto. And when he started this, his initial goal was to create 50 million in equity value over a period of five years. But four and a half years later, he ends up creating a billion dollar in equity value. So the program was widely successful. So last year, they had expanded across Canada, which means there was a serial in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, and this year we are opening one in New York as well. Uh, so, so the basic principle or the basic idea behind CDM is that most of the deep tech startups, they fail, not because the founders did not put enough efforts or the idea was bad or for any other reasons. These deep tech startups, they simply fail because the founders are really, really smart tech people, and they just make poor business decisions. They wrongfully allocate the scarce resources that they have, or they wrongfully prioritize the tasks that they are supposed to do, that way going on the startup. So this is a problem that we are trying to solve. How? By providing a marketplace for business judgment. So a definition, like serial is a seed stage program for massively scalable science-based startups. When I say it's a seed stage program, we have a panel of fellows and associates. The fellows are normally serial tech entrepreneurs turned angel investors. Associates are the VCs. For example, just a few names. Uh, Barney Pell, uh, he flies in from the Bay Area. He has a PhD in AI, has two exits. One was acquired by Microsoft, another, another one which has been exited as well. Uh, he's the co-founder of Singularity University and also involved with Moon Express, where they're basically uh, sending a rover to the moon to mine the moon for economic value. Uh, we have Ash Munshi with us. He has he is an ex-CTO of Yahoo, has total at this point a billion dollar under his belt. He flies in from the Bay Area as well. Uh, uh, Anthony Jan, he flies in from Boston. Uh, Louis K2 is from Quebec City. He had a startup called Talio, which was acquired by Oracle for $2 billion. He is now building an, an AI startup called Coview, which I think a few months back, they raised around $100 million at a much higher valuation and so on. Uh, and it's for massively scalable science-based startups. And so we are looking for startups which have some sort of science component uh, associated with it. Uh, in Montreal, we are focusing on AI startups. So if you are an AI startup, we have some tech component ready to get to consider this program. Uh, at other sites, we have uh, other streams. We have a prime cohort. Uh, we have a quantum machine learning and so on. So the way the program works is we bring in all these fellows and associates and uh, and the startups into live in-person sessions that we organize. We organize five sessions over a period of nine months, which means there is like one session a day every two months. And like this is where at, 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 at these sessions where we have all the fellows and associates, the scientists all come together for the startup to help the startup grow. And this is also a creative destruction lab. Is also a course for the MBA students at the B school. Uh, we are trying to change the way students study. The way we do this is that we tag one or two MBA students with each venture, and they kind of uh, they work with the founders to help the venture grow. Uh, we have, if you want to know more about how the MBA students are involved, we have uh, Adrian with us. That he is, he uh, was an MBA student who was involved with one of our startups. We can we can, we can reach out to him and he can tell you more. So this is how our typical sessions look like. like we have the startup founders, the scientists, uh, the fellows and associates. We have some corporate partners involved, uh, and and the MBA students as well. This is how it looks like in real life. And uh, why do you want to do serial? The program is completely free, as in we don't uh, uh, we don't uh, take any equity or we don't charge any fees. Uh, no. You get an opportunity to develop a relationship with these fellows and associates, and funding happens over a relationship. Uh, you, 
limited access to Silicon Valley network is because the way the program the way the program works is you have the sessions on these specific dates. We have people flying in from different parts of North America for the startups to help the venture grow. So you can you have access to connecting with those fellow and associates, and you get MBA students to help you out. If you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or Pam. We'll be more than happy to help you tell you more about the program. And uh, applications are now open. If you have any questions, more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right, so uh, now we're going to go to our panel. Um, so to start off, we have the fantastic Alson. And so, uh, just give me a second here. Okay. Well, maybe if you want to do a very quick introduction about who you are, and uh, here you go. Okay. So, um, I've seen Fancy, a, um, a research scientist working at Mila. Who doesn't know about Mila? I guess they are. <laughs> cool. So, what? Mila is the Institute of Strict Québécois d'Intelligence Artificielle. And uh, is a non-profit organization, a research institution, which is mainly interested in artificial intelligence and mm, most important, deep learning. So, is bringing together expert in AI from Mexico and the University of Montreal, together with some industrial partner in the same place in order to foster the emergence of AI, basically. So now we are talking about uh, 13 professors, uh, 300 PhD students, and roughly 20 um, IT support and tech transfer team. So what's our mission? The first thing, of course, is doing outstanding research and training the students. So. And the second one is to be a stewardship of AI ecosystem and performing tech transfer. That means bringing the research that has been performed by our professor into product or industry. And what we have in mind, and this is a core to our value, is to work for ethical AI, basically. So what's our model? At the core we have, as I said, academic research and training. Then we have uh, an early transfer, uh, well, transfer and training. These basically are the team that is responsible of making uh, the summer school or the winter school of uh, deep learning and also working together with uh, industry in order to help them take the, the train of AI. Besides that, we have uh, the IT software support. Those are the ones that develop uh, frameworks for deep learning. Have you ever heard about Keanu? Uh, so those, this team is a, is a team that built Keanu from scratch, uh, to give an example. So we have also the CEO, the administration team, who is working with the government and our partner. And so this ecosystem is what we call Mila. And around that we have all, all those bullets, I would say. So one thing that we 
that we constat is that there is a shortage of AI expert in the in the field. So uh, Professor Yoshua has this brilliant idea of developing a professional master and test uh, machine learning. So basically, this is six course and six month internship in industry, or four courses and four month internship. Where the basic idea here is to provide the student with the uh, with the essential tools in order to be uh, competitive in the market and be ready to apply machine learning uh, to specific problems. So here is the the world expertise that you can find in Mila and. Uh, what really matters is to perform AI for you. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>
and so and and beyond the research i mean we partner with uh, with people like cdl uh, to bring the ai expertise uh, with uh, people with district tree basically when we want to bring ai expertise pretty much everywhere and we are organizing events partnering in in other events that we're not organizing and so we have 36 right now industrial members uh, that these are the people who are signed and so but in total they are like more than 250 in our ecosystem it's just that we don't have the bandwidth to just onboard them as quickly as we would want and uh, we have nine academic members so uh so P, uh, again everything that is related to data centered around university of montreal's and again well the three objectives i mentioned it, uh, earlier so uh, just well the third objective is just generally like a uh, technology tra transfer objective so that the knowledge goes from the university to the industry. And so these are our industrial members, so uh, the 36 that I mentioned. So we have everything all from all sizes from all the domains we have uh, like uh, the Canadian Montreal. So uh, you heard that the Maple Leaf hired uh, like the, the general manager, a young general manager that was uh, tech and data savvy. And well, we hope that we're going to have the same effect on the Canadian Montreal and to go moneyball uh, with them. And uh, in terms of academic members, so again, it's everything, so including the Mila, so you just heard about them, and but all the centers, including uh, maybe the, it's, it's a little bit far-fetched, but the Tech Tree Lab, uh, at the HSC, so uh, everything. If you have like a UX problem, these are the specialists, but they gather a lot of data, and they just had their first industry, it's like the first HSC industrial uh, research chair. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of our, uh, our members. But we are opening up, so in terms, so these are the members, so these are the, per the people to which we can send money, we can transfer money, but we are creating, we are developing the notion of academic partners, so these are the people who we can send projects to. And these, these partners, they will go beyond uh, the University of Montreal campus. So, uh, yeah, and, and we're in the Milex, so uh, in the, on the corner of uh, St. Sauvignon and St. Zetique, so in the same building where the Mila is going to move in December? Okay, December, <laughs> uh, Element AI in uh, September, so we're already there. You have, so it's what I call the Bengios Trio. Uh, so, and then just underneath that, you have uh, the Thales Duo. So, uh, Cortex, uh, which is the AI lab from Thales, and then Gravis, who was acquired by Thales, so they are both going to be there. And then Borealis, uh, the AI lab from, uh, uh, from uh, the RBC. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it for, for you better. Fantastic. All right. Uh, so next, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Mojtaba Abadi present. Uh, Dr. Mojtaba Abadi holds a PhD in Applied Artificial Intelligence from the University of Trenton and is currently leading the AI research at Stratacent, a recent graduate from the Creative Instruction Labs program in Montreal. Uh, prior to Stratacent, Mojtaba was working on Sensoro, so that's where I met him before, a biosignal-based emotion recognition startup at Panamwatch. Uh, Manjitaba has uh, been involved with the entrepreneurship and startups uh, even before uh, completing his PhD with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with Stratasim. Uh, so he is looking to essentially unlock the world of uh, chemical smells. So with that, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, I mean, uh, like a new uh, stand to see. Uh, thank you. Uh, like what Sidney said, uh, I was a uh, uh, serving Sensora Emotion Recognition uh, Startup during my last two years of PhD at the Thunder Match. Uh, and then the, after the economy system work uh, with the 700,000 uh, 700, uh, financing, I joined the uh, Stratson, which is actually a great uh, startup. May I just move here? So, I can so we had a fantastic uh, headquarter uh, uh, lab uh, for chemistry and electrical engineering at taking part with San Lovan and uh, our artificial uh, intelligence lab right here uh, uh, downtown. Uh, all right, uh, Stratosyn is about uh, building chemical sensing platform, uh, more like type of e-nodes, uh, electric noses. Uh, okay. 
so uh, right, uh, for our environment, uh, what we're talking to what for molecules, right? Uh, so the air is uh, a lot. Uh, there are a lot of molecules, and we smell them. We sniff that actually, and our neurons respond to that. The brain uh, analyze that and see the smell of coffee, my favorite pizza, and so on. Uh, like uh, my coffee smell, for example, is a combination of uh, tens of molecules. And uh, like book as well, it's a books or in the car. When you buy a brand new car, there are a lot of uh, chemicals there too, right? The out gassing from the chairs and all that. Uh, Wrong uh, in a house, when you buy furniture, uh, there are like chemicals in different areas, right? And uh, basically, the, some of them are plastic, some of them are hazardous. Like uh, uh, zelen uh, can be also in the air, uh, making no throat irritation, uh, lots of uh, uh, coordination, and also like liver damage. So they can be quite hazardous, right? Yeah, these are these are bunch of chemicals that are likely present at our uh, home, right? like the molds in the basements, for example, uh, that we can't sniff them, we can smell them. So basically, we build uh, these uh, sensors uh, that uh, are, um, the technology comes, uh, the, for building sensor comes from NASA, uh, the origin built from in, uh, JPL and launched in the space station to detect hazardous gases uh, around astronauts. Uh, and uh, so, uh, look at dogs, for example. When they enter a room, they have actually understanding of the, uh, what uh, element is in that room. They use like uh, smelling as uh, used for vision. Uh, so we are mimicking that uh, platform of the smelling. Uh, so building is a sensor like our neurons that they, ca they respond to uh, chemicals, and then they, they capture that information. And we use artificial intelligence, different networks to analyze uh, that signal and say, okay, well. Well, what smell is there, what chemical is there, at what level of concentration. So we capture the signal, we send it to our cloud platform, to our uh, server, and we analyze the, the, the signal uh, right there. Uh, so for example, there are two, uh, two examples, ammonia fingerprint coming from the sensor, and acetone. Uh, so they have different uh, fingerprints, and at different levels, they have uh, these uh, vary. Uh, also, we can uh, tell you, you know, with our sensors, uh, what, whether uh, the bottle is bottle of Coca Cola or the uh, bottle of Pepsi, there are like differences. Uh, this is an, another example of uh, some uh, chemicals that we uh, analyze with uh, our sensor. For example, we were uh, seeking some chemicals like acetone, hexanol, uh, zipo, and some fruit extracts. And uh, just by visualizing it in uh, some uh, spaces, by learning these manifolds, uh, we can see that uh, like uh, there are some semantics in those uh, 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 signals that are uh, totally relevant to what we perceive. Uh, for example, nuts families are very close to each other, or like uh, fruit, uh, other uh, fruits are very close to each other. So the, that's how also the, this uh, part of AI works. Uh, so we have uh, patents coming from the, the JP NASA and uh, some other patents who go really low in terms of concentrations, part per billion, and uh, the, 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 we have a uh, little bit uh, more on that. These are some of the applications, uh, uh, drive safety, food safety, uh, and uh, uh, like in your fridge, just imagine that can tell you, okay, at floor number second, the meat is going rotten, you can do that. Uh, that's it. Thanks. So uh, next we have Sonia. So Sonia is a fantastic person. I've gone to know her. I guess it's been about two, three years that uh, yeah. we've known each other. Uh, so uh, Sonia is the director of scientific partnership at A Fright Health. Uh, she co-founded A Fright Health towards the end of her neuroscience degree at McGill University. Uh, with the intention of enhancing the interface between leading research and mental health care. Uh, her experience in, the re in research at the Montreal Neurological Institute and the Douglas Mental Health University Institute has provided Sonia with the insight towards the interprofessional approach that is necessary uh, to optimally refine health care. Uh, she is a recipient of numerous leadership awards, uh, including the Lieutenant Governor's Medal of Quebec, and uh, Sonia's thirst for innovation drives her to create and identify opportunities for collaboration in the psychiatric sector. So with that, Welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia.
me introduce me. Um, so APRIT is one of the numerous excellent teams uh, in, that are Montreal based in IBM Watson AI X Prize. But uh, I can gladly boast that we were ranked number one in Canada and number two in the world. So pretty proud yeah. about, about that. Um, we've been working hard, but everybody has been working really hard. So it's, uh, it's really a team effort. But so at APRIT, we're really trying to push the frontiers of clinical psychiatry and mental health treatment. And so really one in nine people in the world at some point in their lives will suffer from clinical depression. And at any one point in time, that's over 320 million people in the world. An insane amount of people. Depression is the single largest source of socioeconomic disability out of any medical, at any medical condition in the world. In the US, it costs over $210 billion to treat. And what's really alarming is that of the people that do seek treatment for depression, over two-thirds, that's over 70, almost 70% 70 of patients don't improve after the first treatment that they're tried. And so at April, we asked, you know, uh, how is this acceptable and, and why? And so the thing is, is that we have treatments that work, they're approved, you know, we have drugs and the psychotherapies that are on the market, and they all work to varying degrees, but the problem is that we don't know which treatment is gonna work for who, and who's gonna experience which side effects. And so what that leads to is that doctors effectively use guess and check approaches to try to select the best treatment for their patient. And you know, this can sometimes take years. But it doesn't have to be like this because we have best practice guidelines and we have clinical evidence that have been proven to significantly reduce the, the amount of time it takes uh, for care. Um, and, but even with these current best practice guidelines, there is still no way to personalize treatment to each individual patient. So our vision at AFRID is to bring that whole precision medicine, personalized medicine approach to mental health treatment using the power of AI in order to end this era of guess and check. And so we do that by using a type of AI called deep learning to build clinical decision aids that predict the optimal treatment for each individual patient given individual clinical symptom and biomarker profiles. Um, to try to get the treatment selection right on the first shot. And we have evidence that our technology works because using data from the National Institute of Mental Health and IAPT uh, psychotherapy service data from the NHS, we're able to predict both psychotherapy and medication treatment response with around an over 80% accuracy. And so remember, that's in, that's in comparison to the initial 30% success rates. So the, the value that we're really proposing to create is to empower general practitioners, uh, family doctors, and allow them to offer the level of the quality of mental health care as a psychiatrist would, and to help psychiatrists then deal with more complex cases, such as treatment-resistant cases, in order to overall improve the quality of treatment and decrease the suffering and uh, disability costs for, for everyone. So in terms of commercialization, and I'll speak more about this on the panel, we've identified four uh, customer segments. And our targets are HMOs, which are health maintenance organizations and telemedicine companies. Um, so there's an interesting thing that happens in healthcare is that the end user of the product that you're trying to sell often isn't the same as the people who are gonna pay for that product, right? Because the doctors aren't the ones paying, but they're the ones using it. And so, if we, we offer it to HMOs and telemedicine companies to then you know, go and distribute them internally. And also these are organizations that directly profit by uh, minimizing the healthcare costs. And so they're really into you know, having cutting edge technologies and stuff like that. So yeah, that's us. Thank you, Julie. And uh, finally, um, this is probably a company most of you have heard in one extent or another because they tend to get a lot of, uh, a lot of press related to the product. Uh, so Alexandre de Louis Bisson uh, from Lyreberg. Uh, Alexander is a PhD student at Mila and is supervised by Pascal Bisson and Yosha Benzio and is a co-founder of Lyreberg, a company that does personalized artificial voice generation. Uh, having developed his interest in neural networks in 2008, his research has won Nobel Prizes from organizations like Louis. Uh, Bombardier and Winton, and his publications have been in uh, NITS, uh, ICLR, and CDPR, and he was also the winner of the Taxi Cagle competition. So with that, welcome, Alexandre. <laughs> Thank you.
So my name is Alexandre de Lisson. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Layerbird. Um, so tonight I'm going to briefly tell you about uh, what we are doing at Layerbird, and I'm going to try to focus on our early days, so at the beginning when we all started, uh, so to show you how we move from research to uh, developing a business uh, a project. So Layerbird is a young startup. We are about uh, one year old, and we are specialized in artificial voices. So we uh, it's also called sometimes text-to-speech. We convert text into artificial voices. And we, we do it differently from traditional methods. So we don't do normal uh, text-to-speech. We bring, we, we have developed some new technologies to do text-to-speech that allow things that were not possible before. So let me, let me tell you about these new things. Um, so we, we started as three PhD students uh, initially uh, at the Mila Lab at University of Montreal. And we, we developed some, uh, we were working on speech and disease, and we, we made a few breakthroughs, and we quickly realized that there was some potential with, with this. And that way we, we created this startup. So one of the new things that we are pioneering, and that didn't exist before, is what we call voice cloning, which is the idea of copying the voice of someone with little data. So I can record one of you for a few minutes, uh, and create an artificial voice that sounds uh, like you, and then generate uh, potentially anything from, from your voice. Uh, so this is really something new, and uh, not everyone realized that this is going to be more and more widespread in the future, but, uh, but this really didn't exist before. And, um, and it's still uh, at its beginning, so it's still not extremely mature, but it's likely to become more and more widespread in, in the future. Um, one other thing that we are pioneering is what we call emotion control, which is uh, being able to generate an artificial voice, but also being able to um, control the emotion of the artificial voice, so being able to uh, generate an angry voice or a happy voice, uh, all these kind of things. And this is also new. We are the only one uh, right now in the market to offer this kind of, uh, of uh, technology. Uh, so I'm going to try to, to show you a few examples of uh, what we do. Uh, let me see if it works. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to, to show you one artificial voice with uh, two different intonations. I'm very happy that my voice is being presented at District 3. <laughs> <laughs> and same voice. Tricky. <laughs> I will try the other one. Oh yeah, maybe like this. Oh no, if you press and a space, I think it's going to work. No. <laughs> I'm very happy that my voice is being presented at District 3. Okay. So this time a male voice. Liarbird is the best startup in the world. <laughs> uh, so same, uh, same person, but with different intonation. Liarbird is the best startup in the world. There is no doubt about it. <laughs> Liarbird is the best startup in the world. There is no doubt about it. Liarbird is the best startup in the world. There is no doubt about it. So to some extent, we are starting to be able to control a bit the intonation and the emotion. Uh, I can show you a bit uh, an example of voice cloning. So last year, we, we decided to clone the voice of uh, Obama and Trump, and we made them speak together, so we created a perfect dialogue. <laughs> Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wireheart. This is used, they can make us say anything, now really anything. The good news is, <laughs> we offer the technology to anyone. 
this is huge. How does the technology work? Hey guys, I think that they use deep learning in artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that. <laughs> I wish they were doing that. I'm sure they will do a good job. <laughs> saying that's fine but that wasn't really the hard thing about the situation the hard thing isn't setting a big hairy audacious goal the hard thing is laying people off when you miss the big goal so this is uh, generated as well uh, and this is like the type of quality we, we have right now uh, so we are not too far away from uh, what we call the Turing test of being able to, to fool a human being uh, on short sentences actually myself I'm not able to, to distinguish if it's generated or not Yep. So, so this is about uh, our tech, but what can we do with that? And, and this is, I think, uh, quite relevant with the theme of tonight. Um, so when we developed that, uh, we realized that there was some potential, and many people potentially interested in this kind of technologies. So we brainstormed, and we discussed with potential clients, and we we realized that there was a, a wide variety, a broad range of potential applications. Uh, like companies that want to have a unique voice for their applications, video game makers, audiobook makers. So at some point, you will probably be able to choose the voice of your choice to read your audiobooks, the voice of Morgan Freeman, uh, David Attenborough, whoever you want. Um, on the medical side as well, so we, people that use their voice will be able to recover uh, an artificial voice that sounds like their original voice. So we, we recently partner with, with LS associations and we are offering the technology to them. Uh, so many different things and that's one reason why our product right now is uh, our, uh, what we call API, so some interfaces for developers and companies to build on top of the technology. Uh, so let's step back one, one moment and uh, let me tell you a little bit about the history uh, behind Layerbird. So we started uh, at the Mila Lab at University of Montreal, so doing research, and we decided to create a spin-off startup for uh, three PhD students. And uh, at that point, we, we defined our product by speaking to potential clients. Um, so this was about one year ago. Uh, at the same time, we went through Y Combinator. We, we raised some money uh, from uh, some Californian investors, uh, Andres and Orbitz, and we came back in Montreal in, in September last year to develop uh, the API, so the product. And the end goal of this is really to commercialize uh, our research ideas uh, to make a product. So either to have sales, users, or data. Uh, I would like to stress that we, not all companies want to have sales. Uh, if you get a lot of users or a lot of data, it's also very valuable. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so I will, I will skip this slide. And, uh, and this is a list of our partners. Um, we are hiring, so we are a team of 12 people now. Uh, we are looking for researchers, uh, engineers, and business people. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, if you are good, please uh, send us an email at jobs at Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to go into our panel questions. And like I said, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for you to ask your own. So Alison, I guess I'll let you start. Um, <laughs> So uh, just uh, so this is a question for everyone to answer on the panel. Uh, what are the most common mistakes that people tend to make when it comes to translating AI theory into practice? And if you have any experiences that you would like to share related to that, that topic? Uh, well, I would say that it's not really about an AI model. I mean, nowadays, uh, the publication are public. You can find a model that has been trained on huge amount of data. But if you want to make a business from this model, you have to think about the user experience. 
and often I think that there is a lot of engineering in deploying uh, the models and a lot of effort need to be put there also. So maybe this could be the mistake that some of people are making because normally if you think about your business you should think about uh, how you want the user to uh, to be comfortable when using your application to so support a phone for instance mobile uh, mobile uh, devices or let's say uh, uh, can you handle large amount of user at the same time so those are the questions that need to be asked uh, and answered and not not really have the world focus on AI, I would say. Jay, I'm sure you also have a very interesting perspective on this because you work a lot with uh, entrepreneurs. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, but to answer that, I mean, I will remove my Ivado hat and put my old Democratic hat so, uh, in my previous job. And so it's, it's uh, and also some entrepreneurs do that mistake, is instead of focusing on AI, just focus on your product. So uh, basically, for instance, uh, chatbots is, uh, is the hype is one of uh, uh, of the, the cool thing in town uh, in town right now. So, uh, but maybe just a good website will do what you actually need. And us in my old job, uh, the problem that we had is we didn't talk about we had kind of half of a product and it was still in a product phase. So there it was not feature complete, and so there was a lot of problems just to try to sell that product to people and where they wanted something end to end. So the the, the, the space, the, the client space was really reduced. So it's really the don't don't say I'm going to do AI. Just say I'm doing that product and I'm using AI happens to be the tool tool that will let me scale that product. Any uh, any other responses from the panelists? All right, so I, I think something that's really important to consider uh, before going off and building an AI application is to really think about whether or not you have the right data for doing it. Because a big problem uh, in, in, in AI research and advancement is that a lot of the, the technologies developed on these very robust, uh, well-represented, easily accessible to public uh, data sets. But then when you go and you try to translate that, or really, oh. Uh, you, when you try to apply it to your intended data set, we see a lot of problems, especially in medicine, with um, generalizability and in that your, our results to predict uh, treatment res uh, response, for example, don't generalize to, it, to other data sets. And also, if you, just, if you aren't careful in considering your data set, you also risk uh, you know, propagating ethnic and racial biases, like we, we, we've heard of several examples, like you know, the popular prison recidivism recidivism bias and um, other examples and so I think it's really important to think about that even before you you know go off and endeavor on that big uh, mission which that would did you sure as we say yeah uh, so uh, some of the common mistakes in uh, my common opinion is that uh, like a lot of research activities uh, are uh, with the given uh, certain assumptions that don't necessarily hold in the field uh, so uh, validating those assumptions is a must. Uh, like taking uh, some last function, if you want to talk about like uh, uh, training some models or uh, taking some hypotheses uh, as granted this big mistake. Uh, also applying the right model to the right data, like you said, is important. Like there is no uh, one general recipe for all uh, problems. Uh, uh, so this uh, is known as no free lunch totally, machine learning. Uh, so and another probably small uh, aspect that uh, that is very interesting uh, also that I encountered that uh, during my research PhD uh, was uh, it is very important to not remove outliers but uh, uh, properly analyze them and see uh, why they are uh, not uh, uh, properly uh, uh, maybe analyzed and that will give uh, great clues to uh, develop better models and in a way even invent. Alexandre, you work with a, quite a unique and newer technology in terms of a voice generation. What's been your kind of experience in some of the major bottlenecks that you've experienced? Um, so I can show you one example. Uh, if you have at civil, I would say. Um, it's about also data, as Samia uh, said. Uh, so at the very beginning, when we started to make uh, the algorithm work, we made it work on some uh, research data sets. 
uh, and we were able to clone the voice of someone with uh, one minute of audio. And we were quite excited and we, we started claiming that we can copy anyone's voice with one minute of audio. And then we realized that it was much harder to apply this algorithm to real world data. And, uh, and there is a joke in the company um, uh, about my voice when I tried the, the first time uh, to clone my voice. Uh, it sound, uh, sounded like a, a woman's voice. So, uh, so when we realized that, we were quite scared because we, we had already claimed to a lot of people that we were able to do it in one minute, with one minute of audio only. And so it took us a, a bit longer to, to figure out uh, how to tweak the algorithm to make it work. So uh, this is a mistake we, we made. Uh, fortunately, we managed to fix it, but uh, you have to be very careful with, uh, with data. So, uh, Sonia, I know that you're very passionate about the next question, so I'll start with you here. Um, so, uh, for those who that are not familiar, uh, there has been a recent, uh, let's say, protest or revolt for closed publications. So, in nature, uh, there's been an, essentially a lot of AI researchers that have been boycotting doing any form of publications for nature, which is a more closed source uh, publication. So, from the pr perspective of an, of an entrepreneur, what are your thoughts in terms of open publication, open algorithm? Do you think that there's a place when it comes to the startup world and the business world? Absolutely. So I, I'm a huge proponent of open science, uh, both as an entrepreneur and as a, you know, a budding neuroscientist. But I, I think one of the reasons why AI technology has skyrocketed and been able to move so fast is because uh, different researchers and people have been able to build off of each other, you know, through open source, uh, you know, repositories on GitHub or, you know, with the advent of preprint uh, journals like Archive, right? And so I think it's really difficult because you, 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 need, you need some sort of IP, but I don't think the IP belongs in the research. I think there's more creative ways of going about that. Anyone from a different perspective, maybe, or Jeff, you have a not necessarily different perspective, but just mentioning that you can publish and preserve your IP. So uh, there are ways to do that. Just to uh, patent, you, you publish and then you uh, you submit like a, a temporary patent uh, while you're working. That is, uh, it can last for up to a year while you're working on your actual patent. So there's a way to protect your intellectual property while still publishing. And so, and as uh, Axel mentioned earlier, I mean, all of these algorithms, most of the algorithms, I mean, they are already published. We are, the software exists, so we, uh, everything is open source. So uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to actually do things. And in AI, so the value, often the value will be in the data and not in the software itself. So there will be more value in actual, the, in the data than rather in, in the IP. Alson, you definitely have had a lot of experience working with uh, with uh, different companies and different scales. What's been your kind of takeaway from what you what you've been able to do so far? Well, I would say that uh, publishing is good. It's a good thing. As a researcher, I would say it's always a good thing to publish. You know, uh, as Sonia mentioned, well, the AI community is now on the good direction because of all the publications that have been made so far. And uh, well, also from a business point of, point of view, it's also important from a business to publish your work because not only that will demonstrate the fact that your work is an innovation, but also it has been acknowledged by the reviewer and the academic community. And this could be useful when you are talking about fundraising or also you are asking for subvention from the government. So this is a plus for you. Any other thoughts from the panel? So, and I mean, I think that is something that we work very hard on is educating people. So both, both people from the industry and people from academia because they speak different languages and they are afraid of each other. So on one side they say, okay, no, they're going to prevent us from publishing. No, it's not true. I mean, it may be some very specific cases, but it's not necessarily true. And on other cases, uh, if you're doing research, it's just like, uh, I don't know, Pepe de Nuage, uh, I don't know if there's an equivalent in English, and uh, so shoveling uh, clouds. And uh, so, uh, and it's not necessarily true too. People do a lot of applied research actually. So it's really like educating people so that they both talk to each other. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, the uh, protecting is not not uh, being like uh, 
hiding somewhere and, and being uh, totally like uh, closed mind. Uh, so look at big uh, example like Google, Microsoft. I mean, they are uh, very well uh, committing to their open public, uh, open uh, research and public research. And at the same time, they are developing the patterns that uh, IPs and they're fine. Uh, it helps to uh, like uh, what Tony said uh, to move the borders of science forward uh, faster and then benefit from. That's actually the uh, right mindset. So Alexander, I'll start with you for the next one because uh, I think this was a very common uh, a question, at least when I was doing my research for this panel, that seemed to be brought by a lot of different people. Um, so data ownership, when it comes to the type of work that you're doing, is something that you have to be very conscious of in respect to your own work. Um, just before I continue, who here has uh, heard of the GDPR? Not enough people. Okay, so if you're planning to do it, so I'm not the best person to ask about this. Maybe the panelists can give a better answer, but essentially if you're going to be doing any form of business in Europe, you have to be very, uh, you have to essentially allow for your clients to get access to the ownership of their data. So you can't actually close them out anymore. You have to make it very easy for them. Uh, if they want to be removed from your system, it has to be very, very easy for them to move, so, uh, move and go ahead and do that. So, uh, Alexandre, from your kind of perspective, what's kind of your strategy to respect uh, to respecting people's data ownership with uh, with your particular system? Yeah, sure. So, so for us, uh, happy clients are, or happy users are more important than collecting a lot of data. To it's, it's our priority number one to be the client. So, any user on the website, uh, if you create your artificial voice on our website, you will be able to control the data that you upload. So, to delete it at any time, to delete the voice that you, you created. Um, so you, you have this control, and, and we want to, to like, let you use this control uh, at any time. Uh, so with that respect, I think we are already compliant. Uh, you can access your data. Um, if, if you don't delete your data, uh, it's true that we can use it uh, to improve our models, but it's your choice. And, uh, and the user, the client, will always have the choice uh, of keeping or deleting either the data, data or also the artificial voice that they created, which also contains, when you create an artificial voice, uh, it contains some part of the data, obviously, in a very indirect way, but it's, it's some part of, of the data. And I, I would like to, to say also that it's biometric data, so it's a bit more um, sensitive. Uh, so we, we pay a lot of attention uh, on security, so we, we make sure that uh, uh, we cannot be hacked. Um, so we spend a lot of effort. We we have not been uh, like attacked in uh, in one year of existence. Uh, so we make sure, and we are really concerned uh, with that. Obviously. Good. Uh, any other responses? I know Sonia. That definitely that's something that's also very pertinent to your startup. What are your? How are you handling data ownership in this in this context? So. Uh, it is super sensitive and tenfold more so in a medical context, right? It's super sensitive. And so we don't we don't own any data right off the bat. Um, but I, I think so, some, something that's been interesting is the question of, not about the, the, so, okay, so let's say if we take a hospital's data or a, a data from, from some clinical trial and we train and we make a model off of that, the question arises, you know, we have this AI model that doesn't contain the data itself, but it contains abstract inferences and representations of that data, and like weights, and, you know, the networks. And so the question arises, you know, who owns that model? And the answer right now is nobody really knows. And so we've, we've kind of been taking advantage of that and just doing our thing. But, I mean, it's important to, to respect the regulations and um, the law and, and ethics. So, just gonna go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that in Montreal, well, in Canada, we have an advantage uh, in a sense that we're not the US. So, you mentioned the GDPR, but there's also like the Patriot Act. And so, and it's a, it was really like a serious question. And now we have the chance of having like all the big cloud providers are in either in Montreal or Toronto. Well, they, they are both, they are all in Montreal. And so, uh, if I include four of them, including OVH. And so, and uh, it's a big advantage for us because we're not in the States. So it's interesting. And here, I think it's a project, it's C51 or 53. I don't remember, but I mean, it's the kind of thing that I'm gonna look more closely uh, in, in the near future. Any other thoughts from our panelists? I would say that 
from the application point of view, you have to be honest with your client and let them know what you're doing with their data. And uh, well, I will put uh, my research on that. I will say, well, you can also offer them the fact that you will anonymize your data and put uh, this data in the public domain <coughs> in order for other researchers to be interested in this domain and then uh, uh, push forward the boundary of AI. So this is also something that could be done and just let the user know that your data should be used in order to advance the AI. Totally agree, especially in the field. Uh, so I, I have a little bit more experience in the field of neuroscience, and that tends to be a very big issue there. Just having open data is a very big problem, and they're definitely they're working definitely at the guild to try and solve that particular issue. Um, probably one of the most common questions that I get asked at District Three is more in respect to talent. So you know, there's obviously going to be a huge shortage of talent in Montreal uh, with the emergence of a larger amount of corporations coming in, trying to you know go into different research labs at Mila, at RLL, and, and other places. Uh, what are your strategies? Well, maybe you don't want to give this up, so <laughs> uh, divulge as much as you want. But what's kind of your strategies to help and acquire talent to come and work on your ideas? Because especially at a startup, you know, this is one of the major things that we are kind of at risk in the Montreal ecosystem is that if there's all these bigger companies coming in and they're getting $250,000 salaries a year, uh, it's going to be very difficult to compete. So what's your strategy? Uh, so it's really not easy. Uh, we have different strategies. Um, one is to hire some maybe more junior uh, persons and then to train them uh, in-house. Uh, so we like that. We like this because I, I don't think it takes so much time to train someone to be good uh, in, let's say, one uh, specific area of AI. So it's what we are doing. Um, we also try to align ourselves with the salaries of uh, big companies as well. We also try to hire like different people from these big companies that want to work in a small team and maybe have different positions in the company. So it's what we can offer and the big companies like Google, Facebook cannot really offer. Um, so you yeah, have smaller size company, more impact on the directions, uh, being part of a smaller team. So all these arguments. Uh, like myself and Alex, there are a lot of people who like to, you know, uh, uh, work in smarter teams, learn more, and you know, uh, deal with the great problems, uh, uh, so that they don't really receive that these things uh, in bigger companies. Uh, that's one great motivation itself. Uh, like the other strategy is similar to what Alex said, uh, like uh, finding right talents, uh, working with research labs, uh, and uh, working with them. Uh, and appreciate the, their efforts by reasonable uh, good uh, salaries uh, and also it's uh, his up uh, uh, to uh, also make them benefit from the financial output of the museum we accomplished. So for us, something that's really worked well in our favor is the fact that we are a social enterprise. Like we do have the, the whole angle of you know trying to effect a positive change on hundreds of millions of people. So terms of uh, our best talent, I would say, has been primarily motivated by that. Um, hopefully one day we'll be able to offer competitive wages. Um, but yeah, also uh, I agree with the, the junior talent. It's good to snatch them young. <laughs> <laughs> no, me, uh, and what I tell most of, of the startups is uh, don't go for the PhD. Uh, I mean, maybe it was true like five years ago, uh, six years ago when I completed my, my PhD, where in the sense that the, the only people who had like the skills and the knowledge to do machine learning were people with PhDs, but now it's not the case anymore. I mean, you have really good people, talented people with master's degree, and uh, next year you're going to start having people with bachelor's degree to be able to do machine learning. So, and really uh, define the task that you need to do. So maybe this, so you have like basic data science or cleaning data and really doing basic modelization. So maybe people with a uh, bachelor's degree will be able to do that. If you have like more uh, someone who needs to think to have a more strategic approach, things that maybe you will need something with a master's or a PhD. So really think about the kind of task that you need to do. Also, and I think you also have a... Well, I would say that the speed of publication is fast. And uh, and depending on the domain that your business is focused on, you need to to be aware of the advance the advance that happen in your domain. 
So I would say it's not necessarily important, but it's, it's important to look for, for new talent. But what's also important is to train the talent that you already have. So let them go to conference, conferences, let them uh, communicate with uh, research institution through, for instance, uh, the summer school or the winter school that we organize in Admila. Come to and discuss with Mila for a kind of collaboration or participation or what else. Or, uh, we have this program that we call PARI that we offer to startup in order to help them uh, uh, take the train of the AI or bring AI in their, in their solution. So, all those things are really important and can make a difference at the end. So, just keep of the heart with the in the domain. Fantastic. So um, maybe going a little bit more uh, back to the ethics. Uh, so it, around the subject of liability. So if, say if your system fails, what types of strategies, and so I guess uh, the Mila, what type of strategies have you uh, recommended to startups in terms of how, how to handle liability, but I'd also like to hear from the startups as well. And of course, from you, Bebo, if you have your own perspective thoughts. Liability. <laughs> There is several levels of, I would say, liability, but the criticity of an application of your domain. For instance, if we are talking about how to pilot, up, how to pilot up the plane, for instance, I would say, well, never put an AI there because <laughs> I mean, nor the other system that have been deployed in this uh, in this engine are based on system, proof system and also. Uh, verification uh, and it's really hard unless you are able to certify your AI that you will make no mistake I would say no, not go there. But there is also an, the second level I would say critic and uh, well we can talk about think about uh, autonomous car or medical diagnosis for instance well I mean, if I take the example of uh, NVIDIA, for instance, they are raised this problem by uh, relying on, uh, how to say, redundancy, having multiple systems um, on which they will base their decision, and they train or they, they check, they, val they, they validate the model on huge amount of data, for instance, and by doing uh, Reality, something like that. And one thing that's also important when is we talk about creating uh, is to put the human in the loop, actually. So the AI should not be the, the system that takes the decision, but should be the system that helps the human take the right decision. And what the other the other level is some application that have biases and well I would say it could hurt, it can hurt someone or some people, but the, the, the most important thing here is you could have also a path to obtain the feedback when the, the system made some error in order to improve the model behind. So as, as far as you inform the, 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 the client or your, your user that the system can make them, you say, oh, don't use the system in a critical situation. Any other thoughts? So, we had a fun day uh, sometime last year, uh, spend, spending you know half a day just brainstorming. Uh, we call it doomsday, so just really thinking of all of the worst ever things that could happen to our company or with our data or uh, anything really. And then we went ahead and insured ourselves against every single one of those scenarios. And so <laughs> we have insurance, but. Besides that, I guess in day to day, because uh, our, our app is a, it's, a, it's an app that doctors use, and so what that means is it's, it's, it's not so much AI as it is HAI, which is human augmented intelligence, and because of legal, uh, you know, medical, medical law and all of that, the diagnosis and treatment selection very much has to stay with the physician. You, can't, you cannot outsource that to a machine. 
And so the ultimate choice that's made is confirmed by the physician. And so any liability, uh, unfortunately, rests with them. Mia would add two things. So define the cost of a misspecification. And really, go, go even deeper, say, okay, if I have a false positive, is it costlier than a false negative? And so this, this will help you gear a little bit your system. And then make sure, so make sure that, okay, you have an AI, so in terms of machine, your, your product is scalable, but make sure that uh, on the human side, your processes are also scalable. In a sense that if you train 100 models per week, and about 10% of them fail because of accuracy issues and, and things like that, then that, that means that you will need somebody to take a look at 10 models each week. And it's going to, I've been in that situation, and it's going to drain his time and make his life miserable. So, and, and you're gonna burn your, your people that way. So make sure that, and I'm gonna go meta here and say that automate your automation. Uh, and so make sure that you put in place some processes to, to catch these errors and really like, so that your data scientist doesn't become a devil. I'm gonna quote you on that one. How to make your automation. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, I mean, it depends of course sometimes on the business model, like art is a B2B, so we leverage the infrastructures that the bigger major companies have and they have built with these issues. Uh, we are transparent with the, the partner, like the other business, uh, like OEM, uh, and that's one strategy that can help others. So, um, uh, is there anything on that, or I'll, I'll just go on to the next question here. Please go ahead. <laughs> All right, um, so because I want to give an opportunity for the, the audience to be able to ask some of their questions. So, I'll ask one more just to close off before we take a few questions from the crowd. Um, so what new research do you see emerging in the field of AI in the next five years? Where do you see the future going in terms of AI commercialization? <laughs> by companies, uh, two a bit related to what we are doing maybe. Uh, one is about um, uh, digitalization of yourself, uh, not only like uh, speech, uh, which is what we are doing, but also like uh, uh, your visual avatar. So I think, uh, I think in the coming years, this is going to become more and more uh, like widespread. And, uh, and there is a lot of potential like, to build these kind of avatars of, of people that can be used in uh, video games and many other applications. Uh, another one is uh, about security. So how do you make sure that uh, communications are safe and secure uh, despite all these new technologies that mimic uh, or imitate some, uh, some parts of uh, someone's identity? And, uh, and we don't have right now some very satisfying uh, solutions. Uh, and I'm not saying that the solution is only technical and technological. Uh, it might require some, uh, some regulations uh, uh, with governments. But I think, uh, I think there is um, a lot to be done in terms of, uh, of uh, like, uh, making sure that communications are safe, uh, that uh, these technologies are used uh, in a positive way and try to prevent the misuse as much as, uh, as we can. So uh, AI will be the power during the century, like the country that has a more stronger uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in house. They will uh, control, it, right? And they control the power. Uh, with that respect, uh, what matters is also like uh, what it says security, but also on the like uh, safety of the uh, the data, data of users, uh, like uh, uh, AI safety and uh, ethics are very very important. Uh, people who are focusing on those things can can uh, be in quite a big chunk of uh, interest uh, from the governments as well. Uh, in terms of the artificial intelligence research, uh, so far deep learning has, has leveraged a lot from labeled data, massive labeled data, but there is a lot of unlabeled data, semi-supervised uh, learning, uh, and also uh, cross-model learning. Like there are a lot of uh, things that we have data from one modality, but the other modality that is uh, in most cases in the real world that actually can leverage that. Uh, uh, transfer learning uh, is another concept in machine learning that actually also with the uh, people who are working on that and different domains can uh, uh, be benefit from it. Uh, and these are things that uh, are uh, will come up soon. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking mostly looking forward to is definitely uh, the increase in precision medicine, uh, especially in psychiatry. 
uh, my device, but I, I, I think it's really uh, important and necessary because, you know, so, in, so far, especially in psychiatry, um, but in also other areas of medicine, there's been an inability to uh, basically stratify patient populations, you know, um, we have, we present, you know, large groups of, of people and, and, you know, say these are some of their symptoms, but some people in those group have vastly, you know, very different symptoms, and so with personalized medicine, we'll be able to, to improve that. And also what I'm really looking forward to is um, AI will be able to automate some of the more menial tasks like administrative or billing, and what that means is that it might leave more time for the physician to interact with their patient, and so that's something that I hope AI will never be able to replace is really the human um, component of, of medicine and healthcare, and you know, providing that level of compassion, uh, which is really important. Yes, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of that boring machine learning part, where it's kind of processes that people, nobody sees. But in terms of research, uh, so yeah, so for years we've been good at classifying things. Uh, we started extracting knowledge from pictures and, uh, and from content, but now the latest advances are about generating content. So you have like generative chatbots just generate like chatbots out of words on the fly like that. They are not working yet. And me, I'm a cynical person, so what I see coming in the future, so you're gonna have like people who are going to generate, you're gonna have bots generating marketing content automatically, and then you're gonna have other bots that are going to spot the content that was automatically generated to, and will block it, kind of like an ad, bot, uh, ad block for bots. And so they're gonna be fighting on. And so, but it's really like content generation that is going to be uh, one of the big things. Alpha, any final word? Well, in terms of research, I would say natural language understanding, for instance, with the emergence of chatbot, and uh, I, know, I don't know if you heard about that hack that Google made uh, regarding uh, the chatbot taking an appointment. So, I would say that's the future normally, and uh, the, there's a lot that could be done, including, for instance, education, uh, being able to understand what the child is saying and just how it improves it's, it's, uh, itself could be it's kind of potential application that could leverage natural language understanding. So I'd say natural language understanding. Fantastic. Uh, so may yeah, sure. Words? One last word. Uh, one, other, sure, uh, one other interesting thing that actually we got feedback through the CDL program and you're talking with the uh, business owners and the uh, business uh, uh, people is uh, also the interpretability uh, of the results, like uh, understanding why these results are coming up and like uh, this cognition process is something is very, very important valuable that we uh, have to work on uh, more and people are working on the research on that. Fantastic. Any uh, questions from the crowd? We have a time for about four or five questions. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, because when you looked at the, uh, the, 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 the goal of commercializing uh, AI, how about uh, the fact that, uh, let's say you have access to data, and data commercialize the, uh, the program, and uh, you don't necessarily, you're a small company, so you don't necessarily want to create large algorithms or do a lot of research because you recognize you're that small compared to the big players. And, but uh, you know your market and your data very well, so you do a lot of data engineering, feature engineering, and you've made a lot of uh, discoveries while doing feature engineering, and you want to be open to any kind of machine learning algorithm. Uh, so is there a way to protect that and make some IP value out of it? Because you, you did actually solve the problem, you just went up to the, the, the place where you could actually connect to uh, Watson or a uh, uh, an a AWS uh, ML or any other kind of algorithms using different kind of uh, resolution methods. Is there a point doing that or is it just, is it just partial? I'm not an IP specialist, so but uh, probably what what could be patented is the process, the entire process of it. So let's say I have a product that does A, B, C, and so this could be patented. But uh, uh, yeah, again, it's just not uh, me guessing. It's, uh, as a, somebody who's not a specialist. 
but otherwise, I mean, if they are all simple algorithms, the value would be actually in, in your data. The raw data. The, the raw data. Uh, just quickly, sorry, I'm just going to add. So we, we do a lot of, of uh, feature engineering, and so we, we've identified a good amount. And we actually publish all of them, and we publish the results of our models. What we don't publish, though, is the specific weights of the algorithm, and that's really the secret sauce of the, the AI. Uh, okay, so then in that case, you do that tonight. Yeah, it's a trade secret. Yeah. Your, your feature engineering could be part of the AI. Trade secret is very much IQ. Uh, there was another question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question relates to when your technology is ready to go to the market and you're ready to go after your first client, what was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it and achieve it? So, biggest challenge going to market with your first clients. For those that are have clients right market. now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, so we, uh, there are two types of clients, like uh, small clients, big clients, and the big challenge with big clients is that the money there uh, come late, uh, and uh, they are usually connected with big data. That's actually, uh, so the value is uh, if it's on the data, then it's huge, then uh, it's uh, uh, fine, but uh, then the money has to be found to uh, you know, feed the team from some uh, other resources, that's where investment, investments come, right? Uh, with the smaller clients, uh, so they, they, it's more about the, the IP developments, like uh, when we are talking about uh, some small uh, enterprises, uh, they, they want to own the IP, and you want to own the IP, and there will be some conflict, so it's, it's very important to be very transparent on that. Yeah. If if the grail is being able to define the return on the on investment, and this is something very hard to do because, and in uh, in the company in the ad tech, it was really hard to define because you have your model, you have you know your performance of your model on your side, but then once that model is put into production and the result is sent over the client side, then you don't know what they do with it, and you don't have necessarily access to their report, uh, to their performance report. So th there's a gap there. And if you're able to measure that, so if you have a, like a good relationship with your first client, then that, that's, that's worth gold, actually. And well, I, I would say it's something that I told some people about the blockchain, but people in AI, they will have the additional task of, yes, you're gonna sell your predictions, but on top of that, you need to sell predictions. Because people say, okay, AI is all the hype, but when it comes to actually use it, then the, you're going into the game of, uh, again, having prediction, the output of these, of your machines, they are going to be probabilities, so you have to sell them uh, that idea. Fantastic. Any other thoughts from uh, the panel? So in our case, um, you can have a very nice sounding artificial voice, but it can be hard to sell it because of also, a lot of small details which are requirements for some companies, let's say, uh, to pronounce correctly some words that are difficult to pronounce. But there are hundreds of words like that, so it takes a lot of time, and we didn't realize it at the beginning that uh, you have to fix all the small issues that are easier to fix than the, the, the big ones and the quality. Uh, but um, it can take a lot of time and make uh, your life difficult at the beginning. Other questions? Go ahead. So it's, it, I, the idea is essentially quantifying certain types of data that are delivered. How do we quantify their, their clinical right. improvement? So there actually are a validated and standardized uh, self-rating score measures that patients can fill out uh, quizzes that are uh, quite accurate. And yeah, that's, 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 it. That's, that's what we use to, to do. Because it is difficult and, and there's definitely something important in terms of capturing you know, how the patient feels in terms of like their sentiment analysis and you can go really deep with NLP and therapy sessions and all of that, but we're just sticking with the, the good old standardized scales. 
All right, we'll do one more question. Go ahead. Yes, how important is that to drop off the school for you know, kids to have to go to the school? I think that's a good one. Yeah. So the questions around stock options and for our new employees and yeah, around the yeah. Uh, so, uh, for example, that's uh, one of the motivation for my side, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, once you uh, once you join a company, uh, then the value of the stock option you get is from that. They basically, if the value of that company goes like ten x in five years, it depends how uh, early they get in and how uh, they go out, and what, then the exit happens. Uh, can be quite significant amount of money. Uh, in terms of the financial value, and also it's uh, giving you the, 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 the more importance in terms of like you are taking a role in making that uh, medium accomplished. So we really like to give like uh, equities to, to employees because it makes them like more involved, and uh, it also like it's a different compared to the big companies as well on which we can differentiate ourselves. So we are looking for people that share our vision and that are ready to take a risk to work for uh, maybe a smaller company. So we, we are really generous in terms of equities uh, and we like people that are that want to have, uh, let's say, more equities and salary. So we are looking for this type of profile. Uh, yeah. And actually, investors are expecting that out of your company. They expect to give you some equity. I think the number, the, the rule of thumb is like it's up to 50%. It's all good. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please help me here. Uh, our guests are going to be around for a little bit. Hopefully, if you have any questions, they'll talk to them directly. If you want to learn a little bit more about what we're doing at District 3, you can talk to myself or Mozad. Or if you want to learn a little about the uh, uh, CBL Creed of Destruction Labs, please talk to Mazib and uh, Pamela over there. Thank you very much.